Hello and welcome to probabilistic machine learning lecture number 10. In the past few lectures, namely since lecture 6, we've been talking in quite some detail already and we're nowhere near done about Gaussian distributions. We found that Gaussian distributions directly link linear algebra and probabilistic inference. Or to put it another way, they can drastically simplify probabilistic inference, which is otherwise potentially exponentially uh, combinatorially hard, um, by turning the necessary computations for probabilistic inference into linear algebra if all variables are jointly Gaussian distributed and linearly related. We saw that this nice aspect of Gaussian distributions allows us not just to reason about individual variables, but instead to even learn more generally real valued functions mapping from an arbitrary input domain to the real line. This is quite a powerful framework. We started by phrasing these functions we're trying to learn as finite sums over individual features. Then we saw that we can actually learn these features because there are, there's such a big choice among them. So if we f fix a certain family, param parameterized family of these features, we can learn them in a process that um, has quite a lot to do with deep learning and is maybe only weakly motivated by probabilistic inference so far in as much as it's just maximizing the posterior probability for the feature choices under the model. We will return to that in later lectures. And then in the last lecture we saw that there's actually another way to make these Gaussian parametric regression models more powerful, which is not to adapt a, a finite set of features to the data, but instead try to expand the set of features in a sense to make an infinitely wide neural network towards infinitely many features and learn all of them at once. And this is possible by a process called Gaussian process regression, which is empowered by an internal computation called the kernel, which allows summing over infinitely many features in closed form by, by a finite time operation. Now what we're going to do today is a little bit different from previous lectures in so far as we'll take a bit of a like a not a detour, but we'll slow down for a moment to appreciate the beauty of this kernel idea and think a little bit more about it in detail. This also means that the, this lecture is going to be relatively theoretical, quite mathematical, and I know that this is not to the liking of, all, of the entire audience. Human minds work differently. Some people need pictures and geometric intuition to understand the problem. Other people need code, an algorithmic procedural description of how something works in a formal language. And yet another group of people needs mathematical abstractions, symbols to understand what's going on. Today's lecture is for that final third group. There are other lectures in the course which cater more to the formal two groups. What I'm going to try and do today is think with you a little bit about the kind of questions that might have arisen during the last lecture. When I introduced Gaussian processes and actually before that kernels, there may, while you were watching the lecture, you may have had certain questions in your mind that might boil down to the following three. The first one is, I, what is this kernel object that you've just introduced? You using a certain notation for it, how should I think about these kernels? Are they, are they just some infinitely large matrices? Well, let's see. And then, in a second step, I want to make a connection to statistical machine learning to, um, because some of you might be taking the course by my colleague Ulrike von Luxburg, or maybe you have a statistical background and um, you're coming to this probabilistic view from another direction and you may be wondering, so I've heard about kernel machines, of course, 
I know about support vector machines and other kinds of statistical machine learning algorithms that are motivated from the kernel perspective, how do these relate to this Gaussian process business? Are they somehow separate or not? Let's talk about that actually for the majority of this course. And then a final question is, so if, if um, Gaussian processes or kernel regression algorithms correspond in some sense to an infinitely wide neural network, I've heard that neural networks are universal function approximators. Are these infinitely wide networks universal learning machines? Can they learn any function and what does that mean? So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But let's start with the first question, which is what is this kernel actually? And is it an infinitely large matrix? As a little short warning at first, because we only have one lecture and time is finite, I will have to significantly simplify some of the statements that I'm going to make today. Because I want to tease out some important insights and for those I will often leave, apart, leave away or leave out certain technical aspects that are not important for the intuition but of course which are important if you want to really do math with them. So apologies to those of you who are strict mathematicians if I'm going to be a little bit hand wavy here and there if you um, don't like that, then you're very much invited to read more detailed introductions. For example, there is a very um, precise book by uh, Steinwart and Christmann, on, uh, which is titled Support Vector Machines, but which has a very beautiful introduction to uh, kernels as well. And if you are specifically interested in the connection between Gaussian processes and kernel machines, there is a paper that was written primarily by Motunobu Kanagawa and Bharat Shriparumbudur. And I'm also actually a co-author on this, on this paper because it, it arose from a Dachstuhl workshop a long time ago. Um, with you know, Sedinovich as well, where we try to make the uh, connection more precise. This paper has actually been in review for over two years. We're still working on the final version. There will be a new version coming out in a few months, which will be even better. But here you can really find the detailed explanations of how certain concepts in the kernel world connect to Gaussian processes. So now though, let's think about um, kernels and are they actually infinitely large matrices? So to um, Motivate why we have to talk about that. I have to say that I keep noticing that people have a really hard time a, cert like a certain subset of the lecture always has a really hard time understanding what a kernel is. So let me be precise again about my notation. I am using this notation where I write objects like this and what I mean by this is a matrix which arises in the following sense. Here is a set A which is a collection of entries that are, let's call them x1, or actually let's call them little a1 to little a n, that comes from some space x. And then there's another collection b, which is b1 to bm, also a subset of the same space. And then there is a function, little k, which maps pairs of these entries to the reals. And this here is a matrix that is of size r to the n by m, which arises by taking every possible pair of entries in a and b and evaluating the function k on that pair. So that means k a b of that, the entry i j, arises by taking this function and evaluating it on a i b j. So in particular, this kind of way of writing this matrix maybe is suggestive of a matrix. So in particular, we can also write the matrix k um, a b, which is the evaluation, this is just a scalar evaluated of, that is the evaluation of this function k at, at, at locations a and b. So this looks a little bit like when you have a matrix and that matrix has an entry ij, right? Which is just a real number and that's also a real number. So maybe this means that this object, 
is, is like, a, like a computer program that allows us to evaluate subsets of a potentially infinitely large matrix. Wouldn't that be interesting? Well, why would it be interesting? Well, it, could be, it would be interesting not just because we use this notation. I mean, if that's just, just a simple way to write down a function, that doesn't really mean anything yet. But maybe there is more to it. So um, maybe if you can think of a kernel as a large matrix, then some of the concepts of matrices tran um, like translate over to this world. What kind of properties might we be interested in? Well, so what, there, there is, of course, a beautiful large theory on the, that describes the space of matrices in a very powerful language, and that's called linear algebra. And it contains statements very at, its, at its very heart about these objects called eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So for generic matrices, here's a quick refresher, um, there are these vectors, V, sorry, for generic square matrices, such that um, when you multiply this matrix with the vector, you just get back the same vector, but scaled by uh, a scalar. And those vectors are called eigenvector, uh, eigenvectors, and these numbers here are called eigenvalues. Okay? So these vectors are interesting for various reasons. One of them is that, at least for symmetric matrices, and our kernels actually are symmetric, um, because, and of course that's not just all, right? So kernels have this interesting property that, that the Mercer kernels we'll talk about, is that these matrices, if you construct them on the same set, KAA, that those are symmetric positive definite. So this in particular, of course, means, and you can convince yourself of that, maybe as a short little mental exercise, that this means that the function has to be symmetric. So symmetric matrices have this interesting property that the eigenvectors span the matrix in the following sense. So if you have a symmetric matrix, um, then the eigenvectors are um, real vectors and they form the basis of the image and also actually the pre-image of A. Um, a symmetric positive definite matrix can be written as the outer product of the eigenvectors scaled by the eigenvalues. These eigenvalues are non-negative real numbers and uh, this in particular also means that the eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other and they can be made orthonormal by scaling them. So one question you could have is, is there a similar statement for kernels? So are there special concepts for kernels that allow us to span these symmetric positive definite objects in some sense and what are their role? And it turns out actually there are such objects and they are a generalization of the notion of an eigenvector called an eigenfunction. So our kernels map from a large space to the, 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 the cross product of a, of a large space to the reals. So on that large space, the, we need some kind of infinitely long vectors, and these are functions. So it turns out that there is such a concept with a few caveats. And it's due to the English mathematician James Mercer, who uh, lived at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century and uh, taught in Cambridge. He was born, I think, just uh, around Liverpool. So. Um, he showed that there are, and, this, I mean, and this, this result is in many ways the mathematical basis for kernel machines, really, and like, by extension, therefore, also Gaussian processes. He showed that there are four, um, that you can think of the following object. So this, so far, is just a definition. You can think of, you can consider objects phi, which we will call eigenfunctions, uh, which have the property that if you take such a function, our kernel, such a bivariate function, and then you integrate this function, phi, of x tilde against some measure nu x tilde, nu of x tilde, then you get back the function evaluated at x, so at the other entry here, scaled by a scalar, lambda. And that scalar can then be called an eigenvalue. Notice that this is quite similar to the definition of an eigenvector, right? So here we have a sum over the entry j, and we get back the entry i of the vector v. Here we have an integral over the entry x tilde, and we get back the entry x of phi. Now you can imagine that for this to work, you need all sorts of technical uh, constraints, like for example, this whole space has to be measurable, otherwise you can't really talk about this integral, and so on and so on. Um, that's one of these points where I leave out some technical aspects. Now Mercer showed that in the specific case where 
um, X and U uh, are span a finite measure, measure space, and um, this kernel is of this Mercer type. So it's exactly the kind of kernels we've been talking about. So symmetric positive definite type um, kernels, so kernels which span create symmetric positive definite matrices. Then there actually exist such eigenvalues and eigenfunctions with respect to this measure nu. And it turns out that there is a countable set of such eigenfunctions and eigenvalues which can be used to span the kernel in the following sense, in that um, these eigenvalues are actually non-negative and real, and the eigenfunctions are also orthonormal, so they can be made orthonormal. They are orthogonal and they can be made orthonormal by scaling. And the following series, this one here, converges absolutely and uniformly, new square almost everywhere, which means that up to essentially a set of measure zero, you can write in, in, in the input domain A and B, you can write the kernel in this following way. So uh, by uh, taking the outer product, if you like, of the kernel, uh, the kernel's eigenfunctions and scaling with the eigenvalues. So in this sense, kernels really are infinitely large matrices. And this statement already shows that there are a few caveats to this kind of statement. So the first one is, maybe the most prominent one, is that this all of these statements are, is relative to some measure nu. So you have to say, and this is of course maybe not so surprising because we are talking about an object that is defined on a continuous domain. And on such continuous domains, you have to say what it means to sum, to integrate. So depending on how you think about your domain, yeah, you will get different eigenvectors or eigenfunctions actually. For matrices, this isn't a problem because for the natural numbers, there is an, a, a natural way of counting from zero towards large numbers. But for continuous domains, there isn't. And you have to say how you distribute volume over your space to even find out what the eigenfunctions are. And if you change that measure, you typically get out quite different eigenfunctions. Another question, of course, is, well, is this even useful to think about these eigenfunctions? Because we don't know what they are. Right? This statement is not constructive. It's just saying they, they exist. So for matrices, we have algorithms that can construct eigenvectors. And these algorithms are, in general, cubically expensive in the size of the matrix, of this quadratic matrix. So um, in a continuous world where the kernels live, of course, we can't use these algorithms because we are now in an uncountably large domain where you can't just like, do the operations that uh, the eigenvector construction algorithms in linear algebra would use. So you might be wondering, why, uh, like, wh wh what does this statement actually help me if I don't even know what the eigenfunctions are? And indeed, it's true that in general, for general kernels, it's not usually possible to just guess what the eigenfunctions are. If we could, that would be wonderful, because then we could drop the computational cost of Gaussian process regression from cubic in the size of the data to linear in the size of the data, because we could directly write down the matrix inverse of the uh, kernel gram matrix. Now, it turns out that um, actually it's possible to do that for certain specific kernels. So there are very specific families of kernels for which it's possible to explicitly compute the eigenfunctions or at least something that is very closely related to them. And the most famous and maybe actually the only real example of this is due to um, this man. He's called Salomon Buchner. He was born in today's Poland, educated in um, uh, Berlin, became a professor in, uh, or actually a habilitant in, in, in Munich, um, where he actually, during his habilitation work, created the result I'm going to present in a second. And he then had to emigrate uh, due to the rise of the Third Reich to the US, he became a professor in Princeton, um, and um, took American, American citizenship, where he lived for the rest of his life. He um, introduced this um, theorem that is now named after him, Buchner's theorem, which states that, at least from our perspective, if the kernel is a function not just of two inputs, but only of the distance of these two inputs. These such kernels are called stationary. So if you can write the kernel of A and B as the kernel of a single value, which is the distance between A and B, 
then it turns out that such kernels, so for them, so if this is a kernel, right, that means it, is a, it, it fulfills the definition of Mercer's theorem, of Mercer, sorry, of Mercer's uh, kernels, then you can think of this kernel as the Fourier transform of a probability measure. So here's the statement again. Consider a complex valued function k on uh, r to the d. If um, this is the covariance function of a weakly stationary mean square continuous complex valued random process, that's what our Gaussian process is, and it's stationary, so stationary means that it can be written in this form, then, and only then, it is the Fourier transform of a probability measure. So you can write the kernel of this distance tau as the Fourier transform of some measure mu, which is a probability measure. Now, this actually means almost that you can think of the result of, you can sort of see the result of, of Mercer's theorem in this representation here, because this means that you can write, if you take tau to be a minus b, then you can write this expression like this, and you can sort of see an outer product here of orthonormal basis functions. This is not entirely true because Mercer's theorem talks about a countable set, and this here isn't a countable set, so there are a few caveats. But, you know, this is sort of, it's almost like saying the eigenfunctions of this stationary kernel are actually these, uh, this Fourier domain, these uh, Fourier functions. So remember that this here, like e to the, e to the i x um, I is, is a, a Right, cosine of x minus uh, i sine of x. So um, this statement, which is quite abstract is, and very powerful, can actually be used to, to derive concrete algorithms. And here is how this works. This is sort of where you get from formal mathematics to machine learning. So for specific kernels, you can actually compute this Fourier transform. So for example, for the Gaussian kernel, this is particularly easy because the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is also a Gaussian. So if you have a Gaussian kernel here, then you know that it's the Fourier transform of a Gaussian measure and that it is orthogonal, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, it, 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 that it is, that, that the, the corresponding um, probability measure over these frequencies S here is independent. So what you can do is you can, you can draw from this Gaussian measure here random frequencies and use these to construct a Monte Carlo estimate of the posterior mean of a Gaussian process regressor. This idea uh, has various names. It's called random Fourier feature expansions, or people have used uh, words like kitchen sinks for it. And it's due to Ali Rahimi and Ben Recht, um, or at least it was sort of formalized and published by them in New Rips in uh, 2008. This is kind of the step about 100 years forward from a pure mathematical description of complicated positive definite object to a concrete algorithm using insights about kernels, which can actually drastically reduce computational cost, at least in low dimensional spaces, and um, using specifically the Gaussian kernel for Gaussian process regression. So what we've just seen is um, that you can think about kernels as infinitely large matrices with a few caveats in the sense that they actually have something called an eigenfunction, eigenfunctions. These eigenfunctions are only defined relative to some measure and eigen uh, eigenvalues. These values are non-negative. Usually you can't guess what these eigenfunctions are. In some specific cases though, you can actually, even if you can't, we're still, this insight is still useful because it allows us often to talk about, um, uh, well, to do, to do mathematical analysis of the associated machine learning machinery. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of this lecture. So for the rest of this lecture, I want to step outside of the probabilistic framework a little bit and look at it maybe from the outside, if you like. And the reason for that is that Gaussian, in particular Gaussian process regression, is one very interesting point where the probabilistic formalism is very closely connected to other ways of thinking about well, let's call it scientific inference of extracting information from data. And that's also the reason why 
you may have seen the quantities that I, that I show, the kind of computation we needed to do for Gaussian process inference in various other concepts before. And depending on which community you come from, what you've studied before you took this course, you might actually have heard about essentially this algorithm I've been describing, Gaussian process regression, in various other names before. So Gaussian process regression is known in other communities under other names, like Krieging, for example, which is um, mostly due to a guy called Materon, uh, but uh, Krieg uh, was a, um, a geoscientist in South Africa who, who con came up with this uh, a very similar kind of framework, actually, maybe the same framework, arguably, for prospecting for gold in, uh, in South Africa. I uh, in, well, quite a while ago. I'm not going to quote it a year because I'm probably going to be wrong. Um, you've also maybe heard of kernel rich regression if you've taken a, a statistical machine learning class or uh, another form of uh, statistical inference. If you're coming more from the signal processing or control perspective, you might have heard of Wiener Kolmogorov prediction or, in fact, of linear least squares regression. And that final word is probably the best description of what's really going on here. Because, as I've already said before, Gaussian process regression at its very heart is very closely related to finding the minima of quadratic functions it's just that when we do probabilistic inference, we keep track of the entire function, which in this case is an exponential of a quadratic function rather than just its maximum. So to make this argument again, which I've made in the past, let's, um, to understand where this connection comes from, this is maybe the most fundamental and easiest to understand part of today's lecture, let's look at the, at the posterior for a Gaussian process again. So um, let's talk more specifically actually about the posterior over the function values at some location x for the moment given the data y. This um, posterior distribution is given by Bayes' theorem which is the multiplication of the prior times the likelihood divided by the evidence. As we know um, we've now chosen to use a prior that is a Gaussian process by likelihood that is also Gaussian by connecting to the function value by evaluating uh, at particular locations capital X and then the evidence is actually of a form that can be computed by evaluating the PDF of a Gaussian. Now, um, and we can compute that and that's this object we've been computing in, uh, for the past few lectures. And I mean specifically last lecture, but it's just a variation of the things we've seen before. Now, let's for a moment, just for simplicity, focus on the function values that um, the true latent function obtains at the, the training location, so at capital X, at the locations where we have data. And let's consider the um, maximum value of this posterior distribution. So the maximum of this Gaussian distribution, so, so okay, so this posterior is a, Gaussian, is a Gaussian distribution, right? It's not a Gaussian process anymore because it's a finite number of, of function values, so it's just a Gaussian distribution over f at location capital X evaluated at this location with this mean and this variance. Now, the maximum of this probability density function is of course exactly at the mean because that's just a property of Gaussian distributions that their maximum is obtained at the mean. This maximum, we can also think about this in another way. How do how will we get that maximum? Well, if you, if you think about the location where this the PDF uh, obtains its maximum, you could think about the minimum of minus that function because that's the same thing. And in particular, think about the location of the minimum of minus the logarithm of that function because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation and therefore does not shift the location of the minimum. If you do that, then you can just think about um, these objects up here. So if you take the logarithm of that, we get the logarithm of that plus the logarithm of that minus the logarithm of the denominator. The denominator doesn't depend on f, so it's just a constant, so it doesn't shift the location. We can forget about it. Um, that's one of the nice things about statistical estimation, that you don't have to deal with this complicated integral down here to normalize. And what we're left with is the logarithm of the likelihood plus the logarithm of the prior. And what are those? Well, the Gau Gaussians are exponentials of negative squares. So if you take their logarithm and then the minus of that, you just get squares. So the, the mean of the Gaussian process posterior the point estimate, if you like, of our Gaussian process algorithm, the thick line that I keep plotting in the middle of my plots, is given by the minimum of the sum of two quadratic functions. 
where um, this here is essentially an empirical risk. So it's a sum, assuming we have independent noise, over yi minus f of xi squared. So that's a least, that's a square loss, plus a regularizer, which uh, pe penalizes the distance of the estimator from the prior mean function, which we often set to zero, and weights by this kernel gram matrix at the uh, training locations. So what this essentially is, is a regularized least squares problem. And of course, there, so least squares estimation is a fundamental part of scientific inference. And the reason for it is that it's so easy to compute. And it's for the exact same reason why we like Gaussians and probabilistic re reasoning, because quadratic functions are so nice to work with. Cuts to quadratic functions are quadratic functions. Projections of quadratic functions are quadratic functions. And linear maps of quadratic functions are quadratic functions, just like the very same statements also apply to Gaussian distributions. This is really why this idea of estimating quantities by assuming quadratic losses or equivalently Gaussian priors and likelihoods everywhere has been around science for a very long time. In fact, there can be a debate about who invented it. Um, two good contenders for it, depending on your national allegiance, are Gauss or, in fact, the French mathematician Legendre, who arguably came up with it first. So here is an original text from uh, Legendre in the um, 1805, where he came, by the way, so there is, there is apparently no proper picture available of Legendre. It turns out you can find various pictures um, online of a guy called Legendre, but it turns out that it's probably a different person um, who is also, also goes by the name Legendre, but not the mathematician Legendre. There seems to be only one picture available, which was drawn by um, uh, this artist, Julien Leopold Boilly. Uh, and actually he tried, he apparently drew this picture as a kind of caricature of uh, various mathematicians and noted that that must have been Legendre, so he must have been a fun guy um, uh, if this picture is any, anywhere close to his, um, to his personality. Legendre already in 1805 wrote a text about um, the problem that everyone was trying to solve back then, the determination of orbits around the sun of various objects. In the case of Legendre it was not planets but comets. And he um, introduces this, this methodology, this method uh, about which he has been, uh, he's been talking, which he calls méthode de moindre carré, the method of smallest squares. Um, a few years later, Carl Friedrich Gauss talks about the very same method, the method that, um, that estimates the location. In this case, it's actually the trajectory of a planet around, around the sun. As far as I know, in this particular uh, chapter, um, it's essentially the same problem, right? So he's looking for the estimate which um, minima that, so the most likely system is the system where the values of the unknown quantities p, q, and r, and s, etc., are the ones in which the squares of the distances between the observed and the computed values of these functions is the smallest sum. So the smallest sum of squares. Here we go again. Now, um, it might be that Gauss wasn't entirely aware of, of Legendre's work, or maybe he was and he didn't want to talk about it. Doesn't matter. When scientists started thinking about how to estimate unknown objects, in this case trajectories of objects around the sun, they started talking about building estimates that minimize the square distance. And interestingly, actually, Gauss himself, this is the text in which he introduces the probability distribution that we now call the Gaussian distribution, talks about probabilities um, already if very explicitly. So, long story short, Gaussian estimation is related to, to least squares estimation. And whether you are coming from a different community in which you're thinking about least squares, or from a community where you're thinking about Gaussian distributions, doesn't matter. They had, the two are very clearly very closely related to each other. And it's, it doesn't make sense to try and separate them from each other and claim that they are very different things. They are evidently related to each other. So what we're going to do today in the course is to try and tease apart where exactly the minor and technical and specific differences lie between Gaussian estimation and least squares estimation. And in particular, of course, in the context 
of this most powerful framework in this context, which is the kernel machines, where we have an infinite set of degrees of freedom available. Now, many of you will be taking either online or um, in Tübingen the parallel course by my colleague Professor von Luxburg on statistical machine learning, where you will have seen these slides, or maybe you will just even get to see these slides and others like them when she's discussing kernel machines. Um, you're, maybe you haven't taken that course, but you've taken another class on statistical machine learning or statistical estimation or a theory of machine learning or just machine learning or whatever it might be called. Sooner or later, you will have come across this notion of kernel machines. It's usually first introduced from the, coming from the direction of support vector machines and then towards regression. Here we take the other direction. We start with regression and then go to classification later. Of course, because there is this parallel course by my colleague von Luxburg, I'm not going to try and reproduce that course. It is, however, by design here in Tübingen that these two courses take place in parallel and are both compulsory for the students of the machine learning master here in Tübingen. And the reason for that is that we want to deliberately guide you towards thinking about the theory of machine learning from both of these directions. In other courses, if you even get to see both sides, there is often, or actually in many parts of our community as a whole, there is still this impression that the theory of machine learning is a struggle for supremacy among the probabilistic, the Bayesian viewpoint, and the statistical, the frequentist viewpoint. We here at Tübingen believe that that's an anachronistic view and that it's better to combine the strengths of both viewpoints by getting you to think about machine learning from both different perspectives. And therefore, even though of course we try to keep these courses separately, every now and then, and today is one of these points, we try to make specific connections between the two courses by explaining how the language of one of these courses is to be understood in the context of the other. So whether you're taking Ulrike von Luxburg's class or any other theory of machine learning class, if you've learned about the theory of kernel machines, you've come across the notion of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And it's usually introduced in an abstract form. Actually, uh, Professor von Luxburg, I think, doesn't do it this way. She does it the other way around. But Eventually, people usually arrive at this very abstract notation of what a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is, usually abbreviated RKHS. It's actually shorter to say than reproducing kernel Hilbert space. That's why I'm going to say RKHS sometimes as well. An RKHS is a Hilbert space of functions. So a Hilbert space is a space that's endowed with an inner product. Um, inner products are these things that are symmetric, uh, um, uh, non-negative, and obey the triangle inequality. And it's a Hilbert space of functions that contains a specific object called the kernel, K, which is, first of all, an element of that Hilbert space. So um, if you take this kernel, which, as we know, is a bivariate object, and you consider it as a function of just one of its inputs, let's say the left one, and fix the right one, then no matter what the, other, what the right hand side is, this kernel is always in the Hilbert space. And secondly, and that's the intriguing property, it's called the reproducing property, Every function in the Hilbert space can be written by, as an evaluation of an inner product of that function with the kernel that is sort of a univariate function on the left-hand side evaluated at x on the right-hand side. So if you want to know what f of x is, you take the entire object f in the Hilbert space, you apply the inner product to the kernel function evaluated at x, that's an element of the Hilbert space, and you get out f of x. It's like picking out an individual function value. Now it turns out that um, there is a one-to-one -one map between kernels and Hilbert spaces. Now the beautiful thing of having the parallel course by Ulrike von Luxburg is that I don't have to do proofs for any of this. I can just claim that this is true, because um, if you want to hear the full proof, you can ask in the, in the statistical machine learning class. Now, this is the object of interest in the analysis of kernel machines in uh, statistical machine learning. So let's use it to see how it connects to what we've been doing so far, which is talking about posterior mean functions and posterior covariance functions and samples of Gaussian processes.
And in doing so, we will see that here in the domain of least squares or Gaussian regression, or kernel rich regression, or Krieging, or whichever other word you want to use for this concept, these two domains are actually extremely close to each other. These two, these two schools of thought, if you like. Probabilistic and statistical inference. To see that, let's look at the objects that we use in, pro in probabilistic machine learning, posterior means, posterior covariances, posterior samples, and so on, and see how they relate to the quantities that you might be interested in in uh, statistical machine learning, which is, for example, the kernel rich regression estimate. To be able to do that, we first need to understand what this RKHS actually is from our perspective. And for that, it's helpful not to use this abstract definition, but instead use one which is an alternative way of defining what the reproducing kernel Hilbert space is. Actually, there are several different representations for the RKHS. This one is maybe an abstract one. It's the reproducing uh, representation, if you like. There is also um, another representation which is called the reproducing kernel map representation, which I'm not going to prove because Ulrike von Luxburg, I believe, does the proof in her lecture, which says that you can also think of the, um, the RKHS as the space, the Hilbert space of functions, that is constructed in the following way. Um, it's the space of all functions that can be written as um, a countable sum over evaluations of kernel functions at various locations xi, weighted by real weights alpha i tilde, and endowed with an inner product that is given by this expression. So that's a sum over the individual weights um, normalized by the value of all of these kernels. Okay, so that's interesting. Why? Because we have an object in our Gaussian process regression algorithms which looks a lot like this, and that's the posterior mean. Our posterior mean function, if you assume that the prior mean is zero, um, the prior mean is not that important, so if it's, if it's non-zero, you can just shift everything by the prior mean, then the posterior mean looks as this. So to, again, be a little bit more precise, Assuming we use a Gaussian process prior over functions f with a zero mean function and a covariance function given by a kernel. And we use the factorizing, or actually the, the, the generic likelihood, Gaussian likelihood, that assumes that we get data y that, is, uh, that amounts to evaluating the function f at locations capital X and then adding Gaussian noise to it. Then the posterior mean is this object, as we've seen on previous lectures. And what, what is that object? Well, it's, you take the data, you multiply with the inverse of a matrix, so you solve a linear problem. That gives a bunch of weights, essentially. So what are these weights? It's a vector times a matrix. It's another vector. So you can, call, you can think of these as weights to a collection of kernels. So this little mm, row matrix here at location x is a row matrix containing the kernel at x and at all the individual data points, x1, x2, x3, up to xn. So we can write this expression as a sum like this. And clearly, this function is exactly of this form. So what this means from our perspective is that we can think of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space as the space that is spanned by posterior mean functions of Gaussian process regressors. And I've tried to visualize this here in this particular picture. So what I've done here is, I've first done Gaussian process regression. We're using a Gaussian kernel because that gives a nice picture. You've seen this data set before. Here is a bunch of evaluations made, we assume, with Gaussian observation noise. And I've used this Gaussian process prior with the Gaussian kernel. That gives this posterior Gaussian process distribution that I'm indicating with this shaded region here, where the, the intensity of red is the um, density, the marginal density of the Gaussian posterior. And what you can see in the middle is this posterior mean function. That posterior mean function is essentially, at least from the statistical perspective, a point estimate. It's our best guess for what the true function is. We can think of this object as lying, and only this object, as lying inside of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space because it can be constructed by taking every individual datum here, and computing the weights 
for the, like, actually, well, at the point of the datum, we take the kernel. So the kernel is this Gaussian object here, which you can see in lots and lots of black lines in the background. And then each of these kernels is weighted by a weight that is given by, let me go back one slide, that is given by this vector here. So we take the datum and um, make, to make a list of data into a vector, y, then construct this matrix, invert it, apply it to the vector, and that gives a bunch of weights. And these weights can be positive and negative, of course. And you can, I've plotted uh, up the weights here in these <clears throat> as dashed lines. If you multiply these weights with the kernels, you get these individual kernels. And if you sum up all these individual kernels, you get this red line. Now notice that these are not at exactly the location of the data. So it's not like each datum is uh, like surrounded by a kernel that goes through, through this datum. That would be, um, if you like, kernel regression. Like sort of a, that's a different form. It's not kernel which regression, a different, different form of regression. But instead, we compute these weights, which can be positive and negative depending on where this data point actually lies. That's what the matrix inversion does for us. And when people do statistical analyses of these algorithms that you might call kernel rich regression or Gaussian process regression or something else, then they talk about the space in which this red line lives and how powerful this space is and whether it covers certain hypothesis spaces, whether it converges towards the true function, assuming that the true function lies within that space or maybe it doesn't lie within that space and so on. So that's one very interesting and intriguing close connection between the frequentist and the Bayesian world, if you want to use these loaded terms. The, when the Bayesian computes a posterior mean, they are actually computing a kernel rich estimate, and therefore all the analysis of kernel rich regression estimates in terms of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces applies to this object, to the posterior mean. So you can see that as a criticism of the Bayesian viewpoint, because why do we need the Bayesian viewpoint if we can have the statistical viewpoint? You could also see it as a criticism of the statistical viewpoint and say, why should we use the statistical viewpoint if you already have the Bayesian one? Which of these two viewpoints is, more, is closer to your heart depends on your own biases. So to reiterate, the, here is a, it's a formal statement. Let's consider our Gaussian process model where we've taken a Gaussian process prior and a Gaussian, pro and a Gaussian likelihood, then as a, from a probabilistic perspective, we've arrived at various objects, one of them being a point estimate called the posterior mean, which is our best guess for what the true function might be. And it's given by this object. It turns out that this object can also be thought of as the minimizer. So that means as the function within the RKHS which minimizes this um, regularized empirical least squares loss, where the regularizer is given by the norm in the RKHS of this function. A proper proof of that goes beyond what I've done a few slides ago with just the function values at the training locations. It requires a little bit more, but again, I don't need to do that because it's in Professor von Luxburg's lecture. It's actually just a three line proof uses the representer theorem and then uh, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, but we're not gonna do it here because I don't want to reconstruct uh, proofs that are done in the other lecture. So having seen that, you might now think that the frequentist and the Bayesian viewpoint are just the same. So why do they fight each other that much? Well, notice that when we talk about the, the, the posterior distribution over a Gaussian process regression, we are not just talking about the posterior mean, we're talking about an entire probability distribution which has a shape at not just a location but also a width. And that, and in fact, actually more than that, right? it has a whole probabilistic form, like it has an entire PDF which is parameterized by the mean and the variance. That um, variance is a quantity that is very dear to the heart of the uh, people who, who buy into the probabilistic framework because it quantifies uncertainty. And uncertainty, or the ability to quantify uncertainty, are often seen as the, like, the main selling point of the probabilistic framework. By keeping track of a remaining volume of hypotheses, we can be uncertain about the, uh, the unknown quantity. So the question, of course, that we have to answer next is, is there a 
statistical interpretation of the second object in the, the Gaussian process posterior, which is the posterior variance. And that quantity, of course, has to have the nature of an error estimate. So the posterior variance for the Gaussian process regression language is the expected square distance between the true function we're trying to estimate and this posterior mean, which we've just identified with an element of the RKHS. Now it turns out, and I'm going to do this proof while also actually telling you about it, um, the posterior variance, which I've plotted down, which I've written down down here again, can be thought of as an, a worst case bound on the distance between the true function and this posterior mean function we just computed within the RKHS, assuming that the a norm of the true function is bounded. And let's see what I mean by that in, in, in detail. So first of all, let's simplify a bit and assume just for the simplicity of the argument that we are making measurements without noise. So let's, let's, let's just assume for a moment the Bayesian and the frequentist agree that when we evaluate y, the data, we actually get to see the true data. It's possible to do this same derivation also for the noisy case. It just becomes much more tedious then, so I'm not going to do it. And now we are going to try and connect the minds of the Bayesian and the frequentists by computing one quantity that has an interpretation on both sides. Let's start with the frequentist side. A quantity you might be interested in is how far the true function f of x is away from this point estimate that you've just constructed. And we're not going to construct an expected value because there is no probability measure to talk about for the statistical viewpoint. Instead, we're going to say the hypothesis space is given by the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, the RKHS. Let's just assume that the true function is in the RKHS. Notice that we're not making any probabilistic assumptions. We just use this hypothesis space. And the only assumption we're going to make is that the norm of the function, the true function in the RKHS is bounded. It's finite. So, in particular, we could say it's bounded by one. So its true norm is less or equal than one. If it's less or equal than a constant, we can just multiply whichever number we get out by that number, right? Okay, so um, let's th think about this object. So we need the supremum, so the largest possible value for all, among all functions in the RKHS that have a bounded norm of this quantity, the square distance. So first of all, let's plug in what these quantities actually are. So here is f of x, we leave that. And what we're going to plug in is the expression for what this posterior mean actually is. So that's the same for the frequentist and the Bayesian. We've just agreed that it's, the, it's either the kernel rich estimate or the posterior mean of a Gaussian process. And it's given by this. So here I've rewritten the expression a little bit. I basically turned it around. So if I go back to, or actually one slide, here it is. Then here's this expression again. We've assumed that sigma is now zero because we measure without noise, right? And y is therefore actually equal to the function value itself. We just evaluate the true function. Let's say everyone agrees on that. Then here is our weight um, w. And um, this time I'm going to compute the weight the other way around. So in the previous slide, I took y and mapped it through the inverse of the matrix and called that the weights. Now it's going to be more convenient to do it the other way around. Um, we will just call that this a weight. And then we will come back to this later. It's just a way to encapsulate this number so I don't have to write them all the time. Now, as a first step, we're going to use the reproducing property of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which means that we can write these function values, f of xi for all i and f of x, we can write these as inner products of the unknown function f with the kernel. And that means we can rewrite this expression as an inner product squared with the kernel, um, with the, uh, of the unknown function f with kernels. And now in these expressions on the, on the left hand side of this inner product, all of the instances of f are gone. We're just um, left with kernels. And now let's look at the supremum and think about how we find the supremum of this inner product. So this is a standard argument as made very widely, so I'm not going to waste too much time on it, which is uh, based on the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. If you want to maximize the um, an inner product between two objects, in terms of the second object, we just have to set the second object to the first object. Why? So here's the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. If you don't know what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is, it's this statement. It's the statement that for um, functions with an inner product, the norm of the inner product between two, um, 
uh, to elements A and B is bounded above by the product of their norms. This is essentially the triangle inequality. It's sort of an, or maybe it's, an, it's a corollary of the triangle inequality. And um, so now we want to, mm, we have an expression of this form here with an A and a B. Our A is this thing on the left-hand side. Our B is the function F. And we want to find um, the expression that, that maximizes this bit. And we want to find it such that F has a norm that is given by one. So let's consider the function that is given by this bit on the left-hand side divided by its norm. So actually, I've uh, written down here that might help, something that might help. So we're going to consider a B. B is, um, so we have an expression that is the inner product between A and B. We want to maximize that expression as a function of B, keeping A constant. Let's consider the function B, which is given by A divided by its norm. Evidently, this function has norm one. Right, so that's good because we want to find suprema that have that have bounded norm. If we um, so that means by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality on the right hand side here we can put a one, and um, if we compute this inner product between a and a over its norm, we get the inner product between a and, and a itself. That's given by the norm squared. That's just the definition of the norm squared divided by the norm. So that's just the norm of a, and now we have an equality on the left and the right hand side and that's clearly the largest number we can expect to get. So we should choose our f to be given by this function divided by its norm. If we plug this in here, then notice that there's a square up here. What we're going to get is a square of a norm of that function divided by the norm of that function. So, uh, sorry, a square of the square of the norm divided by the square of the norm. So we'll just get a square of the norm back. A little bit complicated, but it's really just taking, keep, keeping track of squares. So this is the, um, that's, the, that's now a value for the supremum. And now we can plug in the reproducing property again. So this norm is an, uh, this norm squared is an inner product between this thing with itself. So um, what is that? We just write down what the inner product actually gives us. So now we use linearity of the norm, uh, and sorry, linearity of the inner product, which allows us to write um, to, to take these, these individual terms in the, in the sum apart. We have this on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, so we have to use two different summation indices. We get one double sum over i and j with w i, w j, and now an inner product between a kernel at i and a kernel at j. And here we can use the reproducing property again and use the fact that, the, that all kernels are elements of the RKHS. So this inner product between a kernel and another kernel is just the kernel evaluated at the two inputs of the, um, the left and the right hand side of the inner product. Minus then we get mixed, mixing terms between this and this kernel. So this gives us a single sum over wi with a single kernel x at xi. And finally, sort of a, in quotation marks, quadratic term, the inner product between the kernel with itself, and that's just kxx. And now all we have to do is just plug in again the definition of W, which involves a bunch of uh, kernel gram matrix inverses, which cancel out nicely. You can do that for yourself, and you'll find that we arrive at exactly the ex expression that is the posterior variance of the Bayesian viewpoint. So what we've just shown here is that um, the, the um, expected square error between the mean and the true function under the Bayesian pro probabilistic perspective, which is given by this object, assuming no noise, is exactly equal to the worst case error under the statistical viewpoint for a bounded norm estimate in the RKHS. This is a really interesting connection because that which I encourage you to think about because it gives a very quantified view on the philosophical differences between the notion of worst case and average case error estimation in the statistical and probabilistic viewpoint respectively. If you ever have the chance to see a Bayesian and a frequentist argue with each other, you'll often see them make these um, emotionally loaded arguments over the worst case and average case estimates. You will hear sentences like, um, frequentists do not make assumptions, they just do analysis. Or you will hear Bayesians claiming that they can make error estimates that are well calibrated that the frequentists can't do. Statements like the one we just found put both of these sides into question. 
what you see here is that actually there is one quantity that both sides can agree on that are, that are motivated in a very different way but happen to be the exact same value. And interestingly, what, what is actually a worst case estimate, so the word worst case estimate suggests that it's, it's a more conservative estimate, is actually an expected error from the probabilistic perspective, which is in a sense a weaker kind of statement. So the, in, if you like, the Bayesian actually expects a larger error than the, than, the, than the frequentist, because for the frequentist, this number we just computed is the worst it could possibly be, but for the Bayesian, it's just what you expect, and quite often you expect more than that, actually. Now, of course, the frequentist could go, no, 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 but I've just, I, I just have this unknown number here, which is the norm of this function, and of course, I could scale by that, and then I just get, this is just a rate of contraction, it's not actually the true error. And that's totally true, but then you have to say, well, what is that bound, actually? And to estimate that, at some point, the two sides will have to talk to each other. So the reason we did this is to see that these two philosophical viewpoints are often not at odds with each other, and even though they make statements that are motivated in a very different way, they might end up with the same kind of um, concepts. Now, what I don't want you to take away from this discussion is that the Bayesian and the frequentist or the probabilistic and the statistical perspective are the same even on this particular problem of regression on real value functions. And to make that clear, let's talk about a third object that is a part of the code, for example, that we've written for Gaussian process regression that we haven't yet analyzed. We've already spoken about the mean, which is a point estimate, which is the same on both sides, about the variance, which is a worst case estimate on one side and the average case estimate on the other side. But the third objects are the samples and that we can draw from our Gaussian process posterior. And it turns out that those samples are actually one point where the probabilistic and the statistical perspective on this problem of regression differ in a very subtle way. And to see that, um, well, I mean, I can make it short. The answer is the samples that are drawn from the Gaussian process posterior are not elements of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And to be able to see that, I have to very quickly flash you with a few theoretical results. The first one is that it turns out that there is a third way to write the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. I've already shown you the abstract one, in the, the definition in terms of the reproducing property, and then the one in terms of the reproducing map property, where you, uh, a representation in which you can write the elements of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space as sums over kernels. There is also a representation in terms of the eigenfunctions of the kernel. That's actually one of the reasons why I introduced eigenfunctions in the first place at the beginning of this lecture. So uh, this is called the Mercer representation, and without much complicated ado, I'm actually not going to do the, the proof, but you can do the proof for yourself if you stop the video here and look a little bit at these two lines down here. The, um, it's possible to write the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, the RKHS, as the set of all functions f, which can be written as countable sums over the uh, weighted eigenfunctions scaled by the corresponding eigenvalues, such that they have bounded norm, and for that we need to define what the norm is, and, 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 or actually we have to define what the inner product is, otherwise it's not a Hilbert space, and the inner product is given by, in this representation, the sum over the weights of these individual components. So that's a very elegant way of writing down the norm, um, or the inner product, you just expand in terms of the standardized eigenbasis, if you like, so standardized by the, by the size of the eigenvalues, and then just take the weights associated. And then, so this is theoretical result number one, which is, well, proved down here, but uh, very simplistically. And then statement number two, which I'm not going to prove, which is known as the Cahun and Löwe expansion, which states that um, draw some Gaussian process can also be written not in the way that we've been using so far by computing um, explicit representations with kernel gram matrices and then computing their Scholesky decompositions and mapping random numbers to them, but they can also be written using basically the results we've used before um, by doing the following. You take um, an accountable set of random numbers that are drawn IID from a standard Gaussian distribution. So here we go. 
IID draws, standard Gaussian distribution, and then you compute this um, countable expansion of a function, which is given by this sort of basis spanned by the standardized eigen eigenfunctions, and scale by these random numbers you've just drawn. So this is essentially the non-parametric infinite dimensional version of one way to draw from a Gaussian distribution. You take standard Gaussian random variables, you scale by the square root of the eigenvalues and map out through the eigenvectors, which are here eigenfunctions. Now, we can use that together with the previous result to compute the norm of um, such, a, such a random draw in the, in the, uh, from the GP in the RKHS. Notice that this is actually the form you would expect for a function that is in the RKHS. So we can think about it as the expansion of functions in the RKHS. So it sounds like a draw from a Gaussian process is going to be in the RKHS. But let's compute its norm. Well, the, the, the norm of the, um, of the function of the draw, the, this random number in the RKHS, or, or the RKHS norm of that function is given by um, um, well, actually, the expected value of the norm squared, sorry, let's be more precise, is given by the expected value of the inner product of this function with itself. And we can look up on the previous slide what that is, right? We just have to sum up the um, individual uh, weights. And here they are the same on both sides. So alpha i times um, alpha i, that's a sum over alpha i squared. And because we've drawn these alpha i independently from Gaussians, these, the, we can move the, um, the sum inside and uh, we'll move the expectation in, inside of the sum and we're left with, and this is a simplified proof obviously, um, an accountably infinite sum over ones. And that's obviously an unbounded number. And therefore, this number is not bounded above by, infinite, by uh, well, it's not finite and therefore, this part of the definition here is not fulfilled. So these draws are actually not elements of the RKHS. So you might wonder, um, maybe that's a point where you actually have to stop the video for a few seconds and appreciate what that means. So draws from a Gaussian process have in some sense the same form as RKHS functions because they can be expanded using this Kahuna Liv expansion. But the numbers that show up here are so large that these functions actually lie outside of the RKHS. They don't have a bounded norm. Now the natural question that comes up now is what kind of outside is this? Can I, should I think of the RKHS as some kind of, kind of uh, um, fuzzily defined sphere and the, RKH, uh, and, and the GP samples lie exactly on the boundary of that sphere? Or are these draws actually fundamentally in a larger space? And the answer to that unfortunately is very technical and detailed. And um, I can only hint at it a little bit using a result that comes from uh, various people. It's uh, actually based on like this particular forum is taken from this paper I just mentioned uh, written by Motonobu Kanagawa and others. It's um, um, actually a, 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 a simplified form of a more general theorem by Ingo Steinwald from 2017, which you can look up yourself, which again comes from a, a different kind of statement by a guy called Driscoll from 1973. And what it says is that, the, um, that there is a way to adapt the RKHS such that samples from a Gaussian process actually lie inside of that space again. So there is another reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It's not the one that um, we use to define our Gaussian process. Let's call it um, H k theta. It's called the power, the theta power of the RKHS, which you get by taking our current RKHS and then you adapt a little bit the eigenvalues to so make them ever so slightly larger. And uh, actually ever so slightly smaller. There you go. Um, which means that we're basically expanding the RKHS because it, it, we are now covering a region of functions with high, which had previously had higher, um, higher norm. Then um, the, the draws from the GP with the original kernel, associated with the original kernel, actually lie almost surely inside of that expanded RKHS. Now the whole question is how much do we have to expand this RKHS? And it turns out that for certain very smooth RKHSs, like for example the one associated with the Gaussian kernel, the, um, this expansion that we need to do is infinitesimal. So if you've drawn 
from a Gaussian kernel, from a Gaussian kernel RKHS with a certain length scale lambda, then what this, what this is sort of essentially amounts to is to just adapt the length scale of this kernel. Then you're, you can actually increase the size of the RKHS infinitesimally and you'll capture all of the samples from, a Gaussian, from the original Gaussian process. Unfortunately, this is not true for more general kernels. There are other families of kernels, in particular uh, kernels that span Sobolev spaces, which um, require a finite expansion of the uh, RKHS to capture all of the samples. This all, of course, is very technical and detailed, and maybe you have, you've zoned out for the past 30 seconds while I said that, and that's okay. What I wanted to say is, what I wanted to bring across is a more abstract statement, which is that, maybe actually let's summarize the whole thing. First of all, in this, when we talk about regression on real-valued functions, then the statistical and the probabilistic viewpoint on machine learning are actually quite close together. They even overlap in certain points. In particular, the, what the Bayesian would call the, the posterior mean estimate, which is a point estimate, also has an interpretation on the statistical side. It's the L2 regularized least squares kernel rich estimate. And it's an element of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. What the Bayesian would call the expected square error, the posterior variance, is equal to what the statistical machine learner would call the worst case error inside of the RKHS under the assumption that the norm is bounded. And then there's this third object called the sample from a Gaussian process. And that object is causing a little bit of headache because it actually lies in an um, in outside of the hypothesis space considered by the statistical perspective, it lies outside of the RKHS. However, it lies outside in, let's say, a benign kind of way because it's actually part of another reproducing kernel Hilbert space that is just ever so slightly larger. So really, the differences between the sampling, the, between the, like the, the probabilistic and the statistical perspective here when we talk about samples is like it's, there is a fundamental difference, but it can be healed by considering a sort of a slightly expanded space, which then captures all of the samples. Now, having done this, uh, philosophical comparison between the statistical and the probabilistic perspective on real value regression, I want to end the lecture by discussing a question that is of course of interest to both sides, which is how powerful are these non-parametric learning machines actually. So we arrived at these, at these algorithms, this, you might call them Gaussian process regression or kernel rich regression or any other name, by at least motivated in my lecture by this um, idea of taking a neural network and making it infinitely wide and keeping track of infinitely many features. We did that maybe with the hope of building a model that becomes very powerful because it can keep track of infinite degrees of freedom. There was a bit of a worry here maybe because in constructing our kernels when we did this in this very pedestrian way in the previous lecture we had to not just extend the number of features to infinity, but also shrink their individual variance towards zero in a proportional fashion. So one thing you might be worried about is whether this has done any harm or not. You've seen a lot of pictures that show that this framework allows us to learn actually quite well generic functions and it kind of retains a lot of um, power, representational power to adapt to more and more data points and maybe it can adapt to arbitrarily many data points and in doing so actually learn any function. Is that true? Well, here as well, the past has, thanks to the hard work of uh, many mathematical analysts, has uh, given us a surprisingly detailed picture, which is one of the reasons why many people who have a theoretical motivation are more excited about kernel methods than about deep learning, because deep learning so far doesn't have that, this deep kind of theoretical understanding. And it turns out that there are certain kernels, which are called universal kernels, which um, have the property that they are RKHS, so the space of functions that they can approximate, if you like, right? The space of functions that can be represented by posterior means that are addressable through some data set. That RKHS lies dense in the space of all continuous functions. So lies dense literally means that in, there's a way to think about the space of all continuous functions in terms of a norm, and then 
for any point in that space and any epsilon within that uh, within an epsilon ball around any particular function in this space of continuous functions, there is an RKHS element of the RKHS reproduced by this particular kernel. And one such kernel which has this property is the Gaussian kernel, which we've been using so far. By the way, I keep using the Gaussian kernel. Do not take this as a motivation to use the Gaussian kernel for concrete applications of Gaussian process regression. In, uh, the, uh, you, will, you will see me use, in concrete examples, other kernels. It's really just fun to use the Gaussian kernel because it, use, it produces very smooth functions and it has interesting properties. So it gets studied a lot. But you will now see, actually, in this experiment that it has a, a bunch of downsides as well. In particular, it's a very smooth kernel and it forces, it enforces very strong smoothness assumptions. You will actually hear about universal kernels in Ulrike von Luxburg's lecture as well. So I'm not going to introduce them any further. I'm just going to say that the fact that universal kernels exist is um, maybe that sort of gives rise to the hope, or is even used as an argument, for saying that kernel machines and Gaussian process regressors are universal learning machines as well in the sense that they can learn any function. And I mean, technically that's true because if you have an arbitrarily large data set, then that data set will address any, can address arbitrary points in the RKHS with its posterior mean and therefore get arbitrarily close to any function, any continuous function. And that should be taken as meaning that you can learn any function. Now well, the problem with this is, maybe you can think about what the problem of this is before um, I actually show it to you, is that this kind of statement does not include a rate. It's just a statement about feasibility, not about how quickly you will address this function. So to give you a feeling for why this is a problem, I've constructed a little experiment. Here is um, a function we would like to learn. It's this uh, black line in the background that you can see. Um, I've created this function. Um, actually, maybe I shouldn't tell you how I created this function. It's just a continuous function. It's actually smooth. It's very smooth. It's infinitely often differentiable. Well, to be honest, the way I've created this function is that I've drawn from a Gaussian process with a different kernel. And that kernel is the so-called rational quadratic kernel. You don't know what that is, but you don't have to understand it. It's just not the Gaussian kernel. And the rational quadratic kernel is a very interesting case because it happens to be um, a kernel that produces functions that are in many ways similar to those you would get from the um, a GP with the Gaussian kernel. They are infinitely often differentiable, so they are fully smooth. And they have a typical length scale, but their behavior varies a little bit around the length scale. And here I'm going to try and learn this function with another Gaussian process regressor, which is created by using the Gaussian kernel, so this related kernel, which actually has this um, at the same length scale. So both of so this black line is drawn from a rational quadratic kernel, length scale one Gaussian process, and we're going to try and learn it with a Gaussian process regressor with a Gaussian kernel with length scale one. The Gaussian kernel is a universal kernel, so the statements about universal kernels apply here, and we would expect this function to be easy to learn for this algorithm because of the universality of the Gaussian kernel. And now let's say I get my first datum, it's over here. Um, I apply that uh, Gaussian process regression framework to it, I get a Gaussian process posterior, and everything looks fine so far. Now I get more data points, here's my second datum, everything's fine as well, five evaluations, and what you can see is that the um, posterior mean adapts to the shape of this unknown function, and the posterior contracts around it at exactly the points where it should be contracting, right? It, it sort of becomes certain in the regions where it has seen data, and remains uncertain in regions where it hasn't seen data. So this looks like a very well calibrated posterior distribution. Now uh, we have 10 evaluations and still everything looks good. And now let's move to 20 evaluations and ooh, something suddenly went wrong. So what you see here is that um, the entire posterior is beginning to deviate from the true function. And this is bad, not just because, um, so in two ways basically, right? One is that the posterior mean is moving away so the error is actually getting, in some sense, larger, the estimation error. But even worse, maybe, the posterior uncertainty is also contracting way too fast. So this algorithm now believes to know a function, if you like, even though it doesn't know it at all. So scaled by the posterior standard deviation, the true function is very far away from the posterior mean. 
And if I keep doing that with more data points, the situation becomes worse and worse. We get strong oscillations. The uh, posterior mean really bends far away from the true function and the surrounding uncertainty drops really rapidly. And um, that's very bad, right? That seems like the universality doesn't actually work. Well, that's not true. The statements about universal kernels actually do still do apply. And this algorithm, as we accumulate more data points, actually will contract towards the true function. It just does so in a very erratic, nasty kind of way. And what you're seeing here um, in this plot is I've plotted the um, error the, that are, which I've computed in some uh, kind of like uh, numerical high quality way of this approximation method as a function of the number of evaluations. And this is a log, log a plot. So um, if it were converging efficiently, you would maybe expect, let's say, maybe a reasonable convergence rate would be one over the square root of the number of samples. So that's a stochastic Monte Carlo type convergence. Um, that's indicated by these um, the golden lines in the background. These are obviously straight lines because it's a log-log plot. But what you actually see is this red curve. That's the true behavior of this regressor. And you see that it's much, much flatter than the, um, this uh, polynomial convergence. In fact, it actually turns out that this convergence rate is, there is actually a rate to this convergence. And it's actually given by, a, um, there's, a, there's a theorem for this by, in, in a paper by um, um, Van der Vaart and Van Zanten from 2011, where they show that this particular con uh, combination of, of kernels, um, rational quadratic and Gaussian, actually converges with a logarithmic rate. Now, you're computer scientists, so you know that logarithmic rates are essentially not converging at all. It's, it's basically a useless kind of convergence, right? You need an exponentially large number of, of data to learn this function or to reduce the error in a linear weight. That's not good, right? So this shows that rates are important. If you just knowing that you can learn a function doesn't mean anything if you don't know how many data points you'll need. So maybe an intuition you might have for that, this is a, a picture that it doesn't always work for, for all people, but if you don't like it, just forget about it. But maybe an intuition you could have is that you can think about um, using a particular kernel to learn a function as deciding to use a particular basis of a function space to, um, or not just a function space, but a, a, a specific hypothesis space and basis for it to represent an unknown thing that isn't necessarily in this hypothesis space. So in this case, because I've used different kernels to generate the true function and to learn it, the true function lies in a different RKHS, right? Due to this theorem by Arangine, RKHSs are uniquely associated with kernels. And what's happening here is that we're talking about an object that is outside of the RKHS and we're trying to approximate it within the RKHS. That's conceptually similar, if you like this conceptual comparison, to trying to represent a uh, irrational number, like the number pi, the, the circle number, on, in terms of rational numbers. You can do that in various ways as well. So let's say I wanted to tell you about pi and you don't know about pi. I could do that in various different ways. I'll have, let's say I have to use rational numbers because, I mean, we don't have a basis for irrational numbers, so we have to use rational numbers. The way we usually do this is that we use the basis that is spanned um, by the decimal fractions. So I can, I can tell you about pi by telling you that it's 3.141 and so on. And I, that in doing so, I'm essentially assigning a weight, a weight of three and one and four and one to the basis one over one, one over 10, one over 100, one over 1,000. And if I do that, then I'll get a linear convergence rate in logarithmic space, of course, because I mean, in a, tenor log in a, in a logarithm base 10, I'm exactly expanding in that kind of basis. So every step, every additional number I provide, the error drops by a factor of 10 on average. There are other ways of representing pi in other bases of rational numbers. For example, there is the so-called Gregory Leibniz formula, which represents pi uh, in, in a basis that is spanned by the uh, odd fractions. So one over one, one over three, one over five, one over seven, and so on. And their weights are just fours with alternating signs. That's beautiful, it's a beautiful formula. Unfortunately, if I keep telling you that, so I'm, you, we've, we've agreed on using the basis of, um, of odd numbers, and I just keep telling you four minus four plus four minus four plus four minus four, that's a very inefficient way of encoding what, what pi is. 
because the convergence of, that, of this uh, sequence towards pi is much, much slower. You see this as this blue line down here. There are even worse uh, ways of representing pi. I mean, they, have, they maybe have, might have theoretical, like number theoretical uh, relevance, but they have a really bad way of representing pi, like for example, this Nila Kanta uh, series. But there are also really good ways of representing pi. For example, there is, uh, so for a while there was this competition to find as many digits of pi as possible, and uh, various people were involved with this. One group that was very active in this kind of race was, uh, was the, the, the Chudnovsky brothers, who came up with really efficient ways of representing pi that essentially is also a serious expansion in terms of a bunch of uh, somewhat com uh, complex to represent um, uh, rational numbers, so a sequence of rational numbers, and their sequence converges extremely fast. So fast, in, in, in fact, that I can show you the very first point, and the second point is already outside of the floating point range, so I can't even plot it on this, on this uh, plot anymore. It's an extremely fast convergence. So what's happening here is that if we want to talk about pi, then this choice of basis is very efficient. And there's a similar situation in machine learning that if you want to learn a certain thing, then there is usually a particular way to represent the learning problem which, convert, which allows extremely fast convergence. And then there are other ways of representing it which give weaker, slower convergence. In the probabilistic perspective, these correspond to different generative models, to different priors and likelihoods. Of course, there are also choices of priors and likelihoods that don't work at all. And um, for example, these could be, for pi, these could be the, uh, the sequence of fractions of uh, even numbers, so one half, one, uh, one quarter, one sixth, and so on. Um, that wouldn't work at all. So um, if you use the wrong prior, you can't learn anything. If you use a sufficiently powerful prior, you might be able to learn everything, but you don't know at which rate. And if you choose a particularly smart prior, then you can actually converge very efficiently. It turns out that there's a corresponding kind of type of statement for Gaussian process regressors, which I want to end on. And that's a very technical, extreme example of what's possible in um, the analysis of kernel machines. It's also due to this paper by Van der Vaart and Van Zanten that I've already mentioned. Um, it's, I'm not going to read out the entire thing, um, but you can read this if you want to yourself. What this statement says is that if you use a different choice of prior, so you don't use the Gaussian kernel, you use uh, a kernel that spans a, um, uh, a, a sub-OLF space, so that's a, that's a space of hypotheses of, of uh, uh, functions that have a, have a finite smoothness, then it's actually possible for the Gaussian process regressor to learn any finitely often differentiable function or sufficiently smooth function, so a function from a different uh, sub-OLF space, at a rate that is polynomial in the number of samples. Not logarithmic, but polynomial. And this, in particular, this means if you manage to find a prior hypothesis space whose elements match the smoothness of the true function, and that smoothness is sufficiently high, then you can actually get a convergence rate that is essentially 1 over n, except for a correction that has something to do with the dimensionality of the input space, um, but that's even suppressed by the smoothness. So, um, it is possible to learn smooth functions, you just have to use the right priors. Your takeaway for that should be two things. First, don't really use the Gaussian kernel because it's too smooth. Rather, use some, somewhat rougher kernels and you will see some, me use some of them in uh, other lectures. And secondly, this is an example of the kind of theoretical power that, has, that is associated with the notion of kernel machines. And the fact that such statements are possible in learning theory are one of the reasons why people are still excited about kernel machines and the associated notion of Gaussian process regression, while deep learning so far has not reached this level of, of precision in the statements, in statements about what these machines can actually learn. Of course, we hope, we all hope, hopefully, that this will change soon. With that, I'm at the end. Today was a bit of an introspective, uh, almost philosophical mathematical lecture in which we've tried to get a bit of a closer handle on the, uh, the notion of Gaussian process regression and its connection to statistical machine learning and concepts therein. We found that, first of all, kernels are really interesting objects. You can think of them with a few caveats as essentially infinitely large matrices. If that also means that Gaussian process regression, because it uses kernels, 
as is associated with the theoretical um, building constructed by stochastical, uh, by, by, sorry, by statistical machine learning for kernel machines. And in fact, for real valued regression, so for Gaussian process regression, the connection is between the two sides is extremely close. There is a corresponding concept in statistical machine learning called kernel rich regression. And kernel rich regression constructs a point estimate called the kernel rich estimate, which happens to be exactly equal to the posterior mean of the Gaussian process regressor. The Gaussian process regressor produces additional objects as well, in particular an error estimate called the posterior variance. And that posterior variance happens to be identified with a worst case error bound in the statistical formulation. Gaussian process regressors can also draw posterior samples. These are not quite in the RKHS, but they are in some sense on the boundary in the completion, even though that completion might take an actual finite value. And finally, we looked beyond this philosophical um, confluence of statistical and probabilistic machine learning and to address a problem that both sides should be interested in, which is how powerful these kernel methods actually are. And we saw, that's maybe the most important message here, that there is a very deep theoretical understanding of these algorithms, which can show that, yes, Gaussian process regression models can learn every function. However, they don't necessarily learn them at a good rate. That rate can be logarithmically bad or it can be polynomially good, if you like high-order high polynomials, if you use the right kernels. So if you want to learn a complicated function, you better use a powerful kernel, but don't expect it to converge magically fast. With that, we're at the end. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>